Good morning. It is uh, good to see you here this morning. I, uh, man, I haven't been back in a church service since Father's Day. And uh, most of you know I came down with uh, COVID-19 uh, on that day. And um, I didn't have human contact for about three weeks. And so I am uh, so eager to be back with you and so excited to be with you. Uh, special thanks to Pastor for uh, allowing me to uh, be here and speak today. I want to say uh, to the church family that was so good to me and my family uh, during those three weeks where we were just at, at our wits end with so many different things. Thank you for all the love and the prayers and the text and especially the food. Thank you so much for all the food. I promise you it did not, it did not go to waste. Um, well, this morning I'm uh, um, super honored to be here uh, to share in this pulpit with you. And uh, we want to begin with the Lord's Prayer as uh, we do every week. And uh, then we will jump in um, to the message together. Let's, uh, let's uh, go ahead and uh, pray the Lord's Prayer together. It should be on the screens here. If not, here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, we bless you this morning. As we open your scriptures today, I pray that the word of the Lord would bring a supernatural strengthening to your people. Will you fortify us, Lord, for the days ahead? Call us, Lord, create in us everything that you have designed us to be. And we will bless you for it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Um, a few years ago, I say a few years ago, about 20 years ago, before my wife and I went into uh, full-time ministry as a career, um, I worked for AT&T, and uh, we were based, uh, we, my family and I, we lived in, in Pensacola, Florida, and uh, I worked there for several years, and um, I loved doing what I was doing there. Um, and basically what they would do um, several times a year, they would, they would put us on a plane and they would send us all over the country to go do training and different things like that. And I didn't mind that because I enjoy traveling and seeing new places and especially eating new foods uh, in restaurants. And so uh, I, was, I was super excited to be able to do that. And um, I remember one particular flight I was on. Um, I was basically going, I think I was going from Atlanta to Jacksonville, which is only about an hour flight. But I remember we sat on the, the tarmac for the better part of an hour, probably a little more than an hour, to be honest. And um, the weather was just unbearable. It was, it was horrible. There were tornado warnings, severe thunderstorm warnings. It was just, it was really a bad moment. And so honestly, I really didn't have a problem sitting there for a little bit longer. I was willing to wait out the storm. Um, but the pilots didn't really think so. They felt like we needed to go ahead and get this plane in the air. And um, so after about an hour of waiting, we, we took off. And as we began to take off, I thought to myself, I thought, this is going to be the worst flight of my entire life. And uh, it absolutely was. Um, it was. It was one of the shortest flights I've ever been on. It was under an hour. But the things that transpired in that hour were unbelievable. Um, I remember being in the plane, and man, that sucker, and I'm sure you've been on air, you know, on flights that, you know, there wasn't a great level of stability with the plane, but I'm telling you, this was the worst I have ever experienced. And uh, the plane was going back and forth. You know, usually you can have your drink sat right there and the drink never moved. It's amazing how much stability there is in the air. But this was not the case. Drinks were flying all over the place. Snacks were going everywhere. And uh, I remember one time looking out the window and I could see lightning in the clouds just under us. I mean, it was just so crazy. It was, it was terrifying. And at one point in the flight, um, I don't know what happened. I don't know how far we dropped. I mean, we were constantly going up and down. But there was one particular moment where everybody was already super nervous, but all of a sudden the, the, the plane dropped more drastically than anything I've ever experienced. I don't know, I mean, it could have been like six feet we fell, but it felt like 600 feet. I mean, we, I mean, things were flying in there. It was the first time I've ever flown, the only time I've ever flown, where literally my rear end, I came up out of the seat and I thought, oh, this is the reason for seatbelts. I never understood seatbelts. <laughs> I've never understood seatbelts on an aircraft. 
So then I started to understand this is, this is what it's about. And it was fascinating to me. Um, as I began to look after that moment, after things settled down, I started to think about all the different people that I had seen in that moment, in the moment of chaos and honestly in a moment of terror, uh, uncertainty. I looked around and there was just a plethora of different reactions that people gave in that moment. Right? If you've ever been on a flight and you, you experience severe turbulence, um, you know that you just kind of, you know, you just respond without even, you know, it's involuntary. My typical response is, you know, I grab the, the uh, armrest as if that's going to keep the plane in the air, right? I just grab it for a sense of stability. As I looked around on that flight, I saw people grabbing other people that they didn't know. It wasn't like their spouse or a child. It was, a stranger, they just grabbed for some, there were some people that literally, when the plane started, they stood up and they were trying to like gain their composure. There was a lady, um, probably 12, 15 rows behind me. I mean, people were screaming. It was, it was a terrifying moment. And this lady, I heard her voice rise above every other voice and she was praying in tongues louder than I've ever heard anybody <laughs> pray in tongues. And um, I remember thinking in the moment, I thought, I thought it is fascinating to me how different people respond to traumatic situations. You know what I mean? And we all have a response. We all have some type of response that we're going to give, whether in that situation or other situations. And then I started thinking about the pilots in the cockpit. And I thought, I wonder how they're responding in this moment, <laughs> right? Because if their instinct is to like hide their face, that's not the guy I want flying my plane, right? But as I thought about it, I thought, I thought, you know, we're passengers. We can afford to respond however we want to when things get crazy, right? But you know who can't afford to do that? The pilots. The pilot can't afford to do that because if the pilot responds and they grab the thruster and we're all doomed, right? So they can't, they can't, they don't have the luxury of responding the way that a passenger or a normal person does. The aviation um, community, they understand this. And so educators, what they do is they train pilots to not necessarily ignore the circumstances that are outside of their control. They got to pay attention to weather. They got to pay attention to airflow and hopefully other aircraft that are flying in the same direction. They've got to pay attention to all of those things. But more than anything, pilots are taught to trust the thing that they know to be most true. Okay, and this is what I mean by that. I was reading an article a few years ago. Uh, many of you know uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. back in the, in the 90s, he died in a plane crash. Um, he was flying, he was the pilot, and um, he had died. And, and I was reading this article, I was just so interested by it, and not to be disrespectful of the dead, but as the article was unfolding, basically all the article was saying was every single thing that he had done wrong as the pilot. And basically what it kept saying over and over and over again. Now there was, there was bad weather, there was a lot of fog, there, there were thunderstorms, it was, it was all this kind of stuff. But over and over and over again, the article kept saying this. It kept saying that he was far too focused on the elements that he could not control and he did not give attention to the elements that he could control. And this is what the article said. It said for, for pilots, for future pilots, for anybody that ever aspires to do this, they said this little catchphrase, and I think it is so good for us to hear today. It said, when a storm rages, you've got to trust the gauges. When the storm rages, the things that you cannot control, as a pilot, you've got to give attention to the gauges, to the things that you know are trustworthy, that you know are not manipulated, that you know are not just your imagination. You've got to give attention to those things. Otherwise, just like for John F. Kennedy Jr., it could spell disaster not only for you, but for a whole lot of people. Today, what I want to do is I want to, uh, I want to read here in a moment from the book of 2 Peter, the first chapter. So if you have your Bible, you may want to go ahead and turn there. We'll have the, the scripture on the screen. But what we're going to find is that Peter, as he writes this, this letter to the, to the church at large, what we're going to find is that Peter doesn't just find himself like on a super sunny day on a beach somewhere and he's just pinning these letters because he feels like this is a, a really good time to kind of strengthen and encourage the church. 
what we're going to find is that Peter finds himself in, in one of the most chaotic moments in all of human history, right? And I think what we're going to find, hopefully, by the end of this is that Peter would actually agree with the aviation philosophy that when it's chaotic and when the storm rages, that we have got to be a people as the people of God, who, who though we, we, we see it, we recognize everything that's going on outside of our purview, outside of our control, but we begin to look beyond those things to the things that we know are the most true. And I think Peter kind of hits on this, and if I'm being honest with you today, I think that the Lord may be leading the church back to the same mentality. When the storm rages, we got to learn to trust the gauges. And so here in a minute, we're going we're gonna to read from 2 Peter. But to understand what Peter is saying really to the fullest extent and to really understand everything that's going on, I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop to the historical, to the context of what's going on around Peter. Right? Um, it, it's so interesting to me. You can, you could pick up Second Peter and you could read it and the Lord could speak to you. He will use any, any moment of obedience in the scriptures. He will use that and he will strengthen and encourage us. But I'm telling you, this little letter of like three pages in your Bible, this little letter begins to weigh a ton when you realize the cultural context and really what's going on when Peter writes this letter, all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow. This is incredible that he would choose these words to write given the situation at hand. And so I want to I wanna just give a little bit of, of context to what's um, going on here historically. Now, Paul, when he's writing, he's living under the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, Paul is in Rome as he's uh, writing these letters to the church. And what had just happened a few years earlier, just shortly after Jesus had died on the cross and risen and, and, and ascended into heaven, what had happened is that there was a young man by the name of Nero, and you may have read about him in, in school. Um, Nero rose to power as a Roman emperor, okay? Now, he was only 17 at the time. He had been raised in an environment that was, that was just super dysfunctional. Um, his father was abusive and he died at a young age. His mother, as he was growing up, she was exiled to like, you know, somewhere outside of Rome. And so Nero was kind of taken from, uh, you know, placed in, in one family for a little while, then another family for a little while. And finally, his mom comes back into the picture, takes Nero back into her home, and she begins an incredible plot to get this young man to ascend to the throne of the most powerful nation in the world. It's really a fascinating, fascinating story. She's the super overbearing mom. You know, we have helicopter moms today. She is the next level above that, whatever that's going to be called. Um, she's very manipulative. She's murderous, but she's brilliant. And so she lays out this plan for Nero to be able to rise to power. And that is exactly what happens at the age of 17. He rises to be the most powerful man, literally, on the face of the earth, he rises to be that guy. In the first few years, in, in what we call Nero's Rome, it was, it was really good. Like the first four or five years, they say that it was his golden years. Nero steps up on the throne, and, and he has a sense of humility about him. Uh, historians would say that his first few years, he was pretty generous. He was very diplomatic. He worked with other nations. Um, he stimulated the economy. Everything was kind of growing and brewing the first four or five years when Nero was there. But then all of a sudden, something happened. Right? I don't know if his childhood kicked in and all that baggage just rose to the surface or whatever happened, but all of a sudden Nero takes this spiral from being somewhat of a decent emperor into the, one of the most despised figures in all of human history. The church would come to identify Nero as a type of Antichrist. As a matter of fact, Christians in that day, they thought he was the Antichrist, although he wasn't. He desperately embodied the spirit of Antichrist. And so he was just a super broken individual, right? He, um, uh, he had uh, a lot of sexual perversion that just, I mean, there are some things uh, I don't feel comfortable saying here right now, the depth of, and the disgust of some of the things that, that he would uh, do. In order to assume the throne, he had to kill several people. I mean, he murdered his stepbrother. Uh, history says that he killed his first wife basically because he just didn't want to be married to her anymore, right? He was like, divorce is kind of out of the question. Let's kill her. 
okay? So it, it said that, you know, he, he murdered his first wife. It's speculated that he murdered his second wife. His mom that was so good and so nurturing and, and, and threw him into power. At a certain point, he got super paranoid about his mom. And, uh, I mean, just, just all kind of crazy things. He plotted her assassination. He tried to poison her, and she didn't die. After that didn't work, um, she was taking a trip on, on like a small ship, and he compromised the ship so that it would fall apart at sea. It falls apart at sea, but she survived and she swims to the nearest island. He pays contractors in, in, in uh, his, his palace to like construct this faux ceiling over her bedroom. And he put some type of weighty thing above the ceiling. And one night when she was asleep, he was going to have somebody cut the rope and crush her in her sleep. That didn't work. I mean, the guy was a lot of things, but he wasn't good at you know, taking care of business. He couldn't get this woman killed. And so finally, he was just like, look, I'm tired of operating in secret. I'm, trying, I'm tired of trying to kill this woman. So he just commissioned some of his soldiers, and he sent them out with billy clubs and beat his mother to death. Right? I mean, just this incredibly corrupt guy. He had so much desire for, like, prestige, and he wanted so much attention and glory unto himself. At one point, history would say, and, and this isn't just Christian history, but secular history, would say that Nero kind of organized this plot to set the city of Rome on fire, and so he went out and he sent teams throughout the major part of Rome, and he had fire set to it. Thousands of people died. Hundreds of acres were of, of land and property were destroyed. Uh, the fire went on for like over a week, uh, it just, just burning in this inferno and did all this. After the fire, Nero tries to come across as the sympathetic uh, to the people, but ultimately what he did shortly after the fire is that he sent crews in and they started clearing out the, the most populated uh, place in Rome where the fires had been. He started clearing the land and then he erected what they call a golden palace in his name right there over the charred land. He erected a 120-foot statue of himself in the dead middle of Rome. People at that point were super suspicious that he had been the one to, to cause the fire. They couldn't prove it. It was just rumors at the time, and especially when he went in and he built his palace right there where the fires were. He basically de uh, um, depleted all the financial funds of Rome during that time in order to build his, pi uh, his palace and to put out the fire. I mean, it was just this, this so much deception, so much corruption, all this kind of stuff. As the rumors start spreading that Nero was the one that caused the fire, he figures, i got to find somebody to blame this on. And so what he does, most of you know, Nero decides that he is going to isolate, he's going to shift the blame to this super isolated, this, this marginalized new group of people called the Christians. And he begins to tell all the people that the Christians are actually anti-government, they are anti-emperor, they're anti-state, and all they want to do is burn this place to the ground, and they've already started doing it. And so he begins to, to place the blame. The people in Rome didn't really like the Christians anyway because the Christians refused to worship their gods. Uh, the Christians were, were a small minority. They lived in purity, so it made the Romans feel justified. Uh, I mean, it was this whole situation. And so what Nero does is he begins to place the blame of the fire and the economic issues upon the Christians. What this does is it starts this worldwide persecution, at least in the Roman Empire, which was mainly, you know, most of the world. And so all of a sudden, Nero is just sending guards out, and he's like, man, listen, arrest them, kill them, torture them, interrogate them, find out where more of them are. Let's just eradicate these people from the, place, the face of the planet because they have, they have basically tried to destroy Rome, right? And so he sets out and begins um, to, to persecute the Christians on like this massive scale. Right, and, and history says that he would come up with these super methodical and just really bizarre ways to torture Christians or to have Christians killed. He would host dinner parties at his new palace and like garden parties. And they would find like a boar and they would go and they would kill the boar and they would, they would gut the boar and, and clean out the insides. And they would take an arrested Christian and put him inside the boar and sew him up inside the boar's body, set him on his feet and release his famished dogs to chase this man down and basically eat him alive. 
They would do this for entertainment purposes. When he would host these people, he would have dinner parties, and as night began to, to fall, he would have Christians tied up to poles all around in strategic locations, and they would have like this tar-type material just covered in their bodies, and Nero would set them aflame to give them night lights in the darkness. I mean, just incredibly corrupt things, incredibly corrupt things that he would do. But what's fascinating to understand is that it wasn't just Nero who was doing it. It wasn't just this state, uh, you know, sanctioned persecution of Christians. Once the state did it, it became a thing that the average person would begin to take advantage of Christians in the marketplace or physically if they didn't like what they say. It was like this, this just really bizarre environment that was crushing to most of the Christians, right? Now listen, here's what we got to understand before we get into the text. This is the environment. Paul is, or Peter is in Rome. When all of this is going down, right, there is literally a madman that is trying to eradicate Christians from the face of the planet. The economy is in shambles, right? Politically, corruption is like rampant. You don't know who to trust. And back in that day, listen, today, politicians are corrupt. But I'm going to tell you what, in that day, if you were corrupt, they'd just kill you, right? It wasn't, it, I mean, it was a very dangerous environment. And Peter sits in Rome when all of this is going on. Literally, the world is burning. And Peter begins to write these words to the church. And this is where we pick up in 2 Peter chapter 1. This is what Peter says. He says, this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. It's by his divine power God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who has called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, listen to this, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So Peter says, in view of all of this goodness that God's, in view of all these promises, in view of his peace and his glorious mercy, make every effort to respond to the promises of God. And then what Peter does, he takes four or five verses and he goes through and he talks about how people can develop their knowledge of God and grow deeper in the promises of God and, and really become all the, the fullness that they were created to do. And this is how he rounds out this first section. This is what he says. He says, and I will always remind you about these things. Now listen, this is super important. He says, I'll always remind you about these things, even though you already know them. And you are standing firm in the truth that you have been taught. But it's only right that I should keep on reminding you of these things as long as I live. Right? So the world is literally, I mean, Rome is physically burning, but the world is falling apart. Right? And Peter in this moment is writing to a church that's very, if they're not afraid or terrified about all that's going on, they are definitely unsure about the future, right? I mean, all the apostles, the apostles that had walked with Jesus, the leadership of the church, they were dying, right? They were dying. They were being persecuted. Somewhere. They were dying. They didn't have a Bible the way that we have a Bible to guide them into truth and into the future. They were very much being persecuted physically and economically by a madman. And I'm sure that as these people are reading this letter, right, I'm sure the people as they're reading this letter are probably asking a whole lot of questions 
as they are reading it, right? Like, I'm sure as they read this, they're like, okay, so um, the world is being destroyed. We're all about to starve to death because of the economy, unless we're killed by a, you know, pathological or a psychopath. Um, all of these things, we've got wars on multiple fronts. <laughs> All these things are going on, and, and, and Peter, the spiritual leader of the church, you're, you're telling us to remember the, pro, the promises of God. Do I got that right? You're asking us to, okay. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Peter, okay, for that good piece of advice. But what do we do, like, when Nero comes for us, <laughs> right? Like, is, do we just die as martyrs? Do we just kind of give in and say, you got me, and chalk it up for the martyrdom? Or, you know, is it okay to run? Can we protect our families? Can we hide from the people that are hunting us? Right? I mean, what do we do if the economy collapses? Peter, I get it, the promises of God. But what if the economy collapses and we don't have any food? Right? Can you give us a little bit of direction? Peter, what if they ask us to wear masks? What are we going to do? Right? I'm kidding. I'm not going there. I'm not a moron. Okay, so <laughs> these very valid questions as people read, I mean, I can only speculate and only imagine, but I'm sure as they're reading this, they're like, yes, the promises of God, but Peter, do you understand what's going on? You're not giving us any practical uh, you know, solutions to all of this. And what Peter is doing in the moment is he is saying, listen to me, I understand the chaos. I see the chaos. I'm not oblivious to it. I'm not even ignoring it. But what I'm telling you to do as the church is to recognize it and to get in where you can and help and, and be a part of the solution. Listen to me. If anybody should be a part of helping with solutions, it is the church. And I'm sure Peter's saying, listen, be a part of the solution. But at the end of the day, I want to recalibrate your focus to the things that you know to be true. Not the things that are outside of your control. Not the things that you're so unsure about because it doesn't matter how much you focus or educate or fear, it is not necessarily going to change any of this. But what you can do is you can focus on the things that you know to be true. And in this moment, what Peter does, one of the most unstable men, right, in all of the Bible. I don't know if you've read much about Peter's track record, okay? But he's not like the most emotionally stable person, right? He's very erratic. Some people say he's like, you know, hot-tempered and he just responds. You know, I would hate to see him on an airplane when it was chaos, you know? Peter is the one when Jesus is being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter is the one. He doesn't ask any questions, right? The people just come up with torches. Peter's like, shing! And he just starts cutting people's ears off, right? No questions. Just feels the threat and he responds, Right? As Jesus is arrested, he's, he's saying, Jesus, I'll never deny you. Just a few hours later, he's not only denying Jesus, but he's cussing like a sailor while he does it. Right? Later in Peter's life, he's caught in this moment. He's confronted by Paul because what Peter's doing is he's trying to play both sides of the aisle between the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's trying to make sure he doesn't, he doesn't say anything that's going to be offensive. And Paul steps in and confronts him. But all of a sudden, this guy who has, you know, gross instability, all of a sudden, in this letter at the end of his life in 2 Peter, all of a sudden, he begins to become the stability that the church so desperately needs. All of a sudden, Peter, he's not just called Simon Peter the rock. Now he is fulfilling that prophetic word that was spoken over him. Now he is creating a place of stability so that the church can grow and stay. But how does he do it? How does he come in and say this thing when so many people have so many very real, very relevant, very logical questions about all the chaos that's going on? What does he do? He reminds them of the promises of God. He comes to him and he says, listen, I know you know this, right? And I would say, I would say this to our Christian life family. Everything that I'm about to say, I know you know this, right? And listen to me, you have stood the test of time in your faith and you are mature just like Peter is writing to his people. You are doing so well. But what Peter's trying to get us to understand is that sometimes we got to remember to remember. Sometimes we got to remember not only who we are, 
But we got to remember whose we are. We've got to remember our spiritual foundations. We've got to remember that all the, the chaos is just going, everything is just going crazy and it's buck wild out there. That there are some gauges that we need to be paying attention to so we don't shipwreck the plane, right? And so Peter does this by, by reminding people. Now the question is, why does, Peter, why does Peter feel the need that he's got to remind people? was because the people in Peter's day were a lot like me and you today in, in a lot of ways. And I mean that to say that oftentimes us and the people that Peter's dealing with, especially in times of chaos, we oftentimes begin to forget the things that we need to remember and we begin to remember the things we should be forgetting, right? So this is what happened with the children of Israel as Moses is leading them from the tyranny and oppression and slavery of Egypt for hundreds of years. He's leading them and God has worked powerfully and he has split seas and he has caused plagues and locusts. He has done so much for them. He has caused food to come and to feed millions of people day in and day out. And all of a sudden, the people of Israel in mass droves, what did they begin to do? They remember to, they begin to forget all the hardship of Egypt. They begin to forget the goodness of God instead of remembering the goodness of God. And so even like in a moment like this, we find ourselves in such a peculiar place in our nation, really in our world, right? And there's so much chaos out there and we're not really sure what to do or how to act, honestly, what to think. And Peter, writing through the, 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 you know, the tunnels of history, he comes with a loud voice and he says, listen to me, people. In an environment like this, I know you know this, but I got to remind you to remember the promises yeah. of God. And I think Peter, if he were here, would have a very similar message for us today. This isn't like a new strategy that Peter was kind of writing. He was like, maybe I should get them to remember what they've forgotten. I don't know, maybe this will work, right? No, this is not a new strategy. The Lord has used this, this idea of remembering the foundations all the way through scripture, all throughout Israel history. Uh, he would have people erect altars so that when they passed by them, they would remember what God had done. The Lord would say, look, these words that I'm speaking to you, don't just read them and go away. Tie them around your neck, right? So that you can remember when your children are being raised, tell them about the stories of God so that they can remember the promises of God when chaos comes. The, the communion, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, so much about that is remembering what Jesus has done. And so Paul, he doesn't give this call for naivety. He's not saying, listen, people, that stuff really doesn't matter. And furthermore, let me say this. I'm not issuing a call to naivety, right? But what I am saying is that we've got to begin to look beyond what is happening to something greater that we know is true. Yes. We've got to stop being so focused on all that stuff. That I'm pointing like you're the problem. That's not what I mean. <laughs> We're, we're pointing and we're, we're so just, it is eating our soul. It is, it is feasting on our soul. All the opinions and all the news articles, all the things are just eating away at our soul. And Peter would step in and say, listen to me. I know that it's there. And I know that you need to be educated. I know that you need to listen. But more than all of that, you need to set your feet on this. Yes. And remember the goodness of God. Remember the promises of God so that he can propel you into everything that he has created you to be. It, I mean, this is true in so many areas of life. Have you, have you ever, okay, so even like something as ridiculous as football, you realize that remembering certain things is why people, do you know why the Patriots win so much? It's because they cheat, right? No, no, okay. Besides that, do you? I don't even watch NFL, I don't care. No, but listen to me. Do you, know, do you know why the Patriots win like they do? It's because their coaching staff, more than any other team in the NFL, 
they always and forever bring them back to the fundamentals. It's never about trick plays, right? It's never about a punaruski. It's never about any of that stuff. It's always about how to tackle. It's always about how to block. It's always about catching the ball before you run. It's always coming back to these things. And this is why, because the coaching staff knows this. When the team gets exhausted, when they feel like winning is out of reach, if we go back to the fundamentals, this will keep us in the game, right? And that's why they win more than any other thing. It's not about creativity. It's about remembering what you already know that will propel you to ultimately where you want to be. And so Peter calls these the great and precious promises of God. Now, Peter doesn't go and he doesn't explain to us all the, all the uh, different layers. But today, I, what I want to do is I just want to real quickly run through six promises of God that I feel like the church today has got to get her arms around. We have got to dig deeply into these promises. In, in, the, second, in the second letter that Peter wrote, more than 15 times in like three or four pages, more than 15 times, he says that you need to grow into the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. And what he's not saying is you need to go off and start learning new things. What he say, he's not saying like broaden your knowledge about Jesus. He's saying deepen your knowledge about what you already know, right? And so everything I'm going to say today over the next few minutes, you already know it. And if you get bored, it's my fault, okay? But I'm still going to tell you because I think it's something that we all have to remember so that we can be everything that God has created us to be. So let's go ahead and run through these. Number one, one of the promises or giftings that we've got to remember is what's behind us. Can I tell you this? In Christian America, it is so easy for the person to come to the altar to respond to Christ, have a genuine conversion experience, and to leave the gospel right there at that altar. And can I tell you that, that again, it's not about broadening your knowledge of the gospel and the salvation that God offers. It's about deepening the gravity of it, right? Like it is so good for us to remember often and consistently. It's so good for us to remember how broken we are as human beings. It's good, listen, I know, I know this isn't like super popular, but it is so good for us to remember the depth of sin in which we came from, because it's not until we appreciate the depth of sin that we've come from can we fully appreciate the gift of God and his grace that we've been given. And so it's so good for us to remember what, what we once were and that conversion experience and who we are now. It's good for us to remember that the old has passed away and the new has come. And to just really relish in that moment and to feast on those kind of things, to, to understand that salvation is not just a judicial thing where we, you know, we no longer have to go to hell. We get to go to heaven. That is amazing and that is glorious. But can I tell you, salvation is so far beyond that. It is mind-blowing. It's not just justification where, you know, somebody once said that, that justification is when we are declared innocent in the courtroom of God. And I celebrate God for that. But in that same moment, adoption takes place, a spiritual adoption. And if in the, in the judiciary sense, if we are declared innocent in God's courtroom, in that same moment, we are declared welcomed into God's living room. We are now the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. And I'm going to tell you, you know, you know how much mental health goes on right now, the wrong direction for this one simple thing that we forget whose we are. We forget the hands of God that hold us and direct us in his sovereign nature, his care for us, that every number on our head is counted if you still have hair. <laughs> And if you don't, he knows that too. And so it's so good for us to remember the things that are behind us. But I want to tell you, number two, we got to remember the, the people who are around us. We've got to remember that Jesus made a promise to his followers that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against her. Right. And so what God has done is he has given us a family of believers. And can I tell you, like in moments like this, 
in our nation's history, we need each other more than we have ever needed each other. We need to be a people that are fighting to come together and to build community, even when sometimes we're not allowed to, right? That is the gift. That is the blessing of technology, that we can connect with people, that we can become together with people. Listen, the Bible makes it clear that that when we were adopted into the family of God, we became brothers and sisters in Christ, right? And it's, it's 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 a spiritual sibling uh, type relationship that really transcends everything biologically. You understand that there, there is such a depth here of the goodness of God in giving us the gift of each other. But I'm going to tell you this, one of the most undervalued things is the family of God. You know, I, uh, I remember um, last summer, it, uh, my family, we, my wife and I, uh, we have two biological children and we have three adopted children. And last summer, my wife, we have a neighborhood pool, and my wife was uh, taking our our little ones to the pool, and my my biological son was kind of helping her take the little girls up to the pool that um, we've adopted into our family, and and he's walking with them, and all of a sudden, he sees uh, a friend of his, and, and the friend's a little bit younger, and he runs up, and he's talking to Easton, and he says, oh, are these your sisters? And Easton said, yeah. And he said, well, well, which one's your real sister? And Easton said, what do you mean? They're, they're all my real sister. And he said, I, I know, but which one is your real sister? And Easton, he wasn't being arrogant. I mean, he, it's just the mindset that he had. He wasn't trying to be arrogant. Or, he was like, I don't understand what you're saying. They are all my real sister, <laughs> right? And the kid persisted. And he said, but your real sister. He said, they're all my real sister. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say, right? And I think that that same mindset needs to be evident in the body of Christ. This is not just people I gather with. It's not, and I love the work, I think we need to have community and all this, but it is not just a community. It is a family of believers, and it transcends biology. It is more real than biology. It is spiritual in nature. And especially in moments like this, we need to be a people who fight for this kind of thing. I can't tell you, we've, we've had people that, that would come over to our house, uh, especially in the, in the, at the beginning of all this, we didn't know what the virus was or anything like that, and we literally would stand on our front porch for hours. We would stand in the front yard from me to pastor for hours and just talk. We would have people come over in the backyard and we would have this table between us, but again, we'd be from me to the front row and we'd be talking like this, <laughs> but we were fighting for it. It is so easy right now to not fight. It is so easy to isolate, and it is so much easier to think of our spiritual community on social media. But can I just remind you, that is not the spiritual community that Jesus said would prevail. The spiritual community he said would prevail would be the sons and daughters of God the brothers and sisters that would come together and do the work for his kingdom. So we've got to remember who's around us. We've got to remember even more than that, who is within us. Jesus literally said, he literally called the, the Holy Spirit the promise of the Father. He said, this is the promise. This is the gift of God. Paul said this. He said, do you not know that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells inside of you? Listen to me. God Almighty dwells inside of you. You understand? Like we have got to remember who lives within us. We've got to latch on to that. And I'm going to tell you right now, listen, there is a lot. There is a lot of bad teaching right now in the church. I don't think in our church. I think it's the only right teaching. Okay, but (laughs) I'm kidding. If you're online watching, I don't believe that. But I am saying this. There's a lot of bad teaching going on right now in the body of Christ, specifically in regards to Holy Spirit. And let me just caution you, as much as we love live stream and as much as we love a good sound bite, can I tell you the kingdom of God is not about sound bites. We do not accomplish anything with sound bites. Sometimes, even though, listen, 
even though something sounds good, does not mean that it is good, right. right? And so we've got to be very cautious, even about the teaching that sounds good. I've heard, man, in the past month, I've heard like three different, I mean like high level people, I'm not worthy to, to spit and tie their shoes. You know what I'm saying? I mean, high level people, but their teaching about who Holy Spirit is, is borderline heresy. And I'm, and I'm not talking about people that are like different than we are. I'm talking about people in our types of circles, borderline heresy. And let me tell you, this is usually how it begins. It usually begins by somebody behind a microphone saying, well, the Holy Spirit to me is da, 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 da. And I just want to say this. I don't care what the Holy Spirit is to you, because that doesn't mean anything to me. The only thing that means anything to me is what scripture says Holy Spirit is. And, and listen to me, I'm not, and listen, I know if, oh, the Lord knows and if the Lord measured their hearts, I'm sure they love Jesus far more than I do. I am not judging them, I am judging their teaching. And I'm saying we've got to be real careful about what we're allowing to enter into our souls. The Holy Spirit in scripture, is described as the breath of the living God that fills us. He is described as the refiner's fire who burns away sin, who makes us pure like gold. He's described as a wind. He's described as water that shapes as it flows through us. He shapes us and he molds us into everything that he is calling us to be. He is the, the oil that anoints us to do the work of the ministry. This is who the Holy Spirit is. And I know that Holy Spirit can give us uh, experiences and, and all of the, and I believe that and I embrace that. All I'm saying is this, we need to make sure that whatever people are teaching Holy Spirit is aligns with this right here. And if it doesn't, we need to move quickly, quickly away, okay? And so we've got to remember who Holy Spirit is in us. Number four, we've got to remember, this is huge, we have got to remember who is above us. Do you realize that there is a king that operates in a kingdom that is so unaffected by anything that happens on this earth? Amen. You understand that, that in the midst of our chaos, in the, in the kingdom of heaven, there is no chaos. There is perfect peace and utter. And C.S. Lewis would say, less. he would say, it's as if God in, in all of eternity, outside of time and space, has all of human history and the universes in a capsule, and he is out here bidding his business and checking in on the people. That is how far removed, not, not in an impersonal sense, but in an unaffected sense, that God is from the chaos that's happening right now. In his kingdom, there is perfect peace. He is sovereign, meaning he is all-powerful, that nothing affects him. He is not surprised. He is not taken back. He is not nervous about the future. He is God Almighty. Listen to what John would say in Revelation. He said, this is his description of Jesus. He said, then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in its finest and pure white linen followed him on white horses and from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords completely and utterly unaffected by the chaos that surrounds us in this life. He is the Father, and this is what he calls us to do. He says, listen, listen to what Paul says in Colossians. He says, since you've been raised to new life in Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. 
Now, Paul isn't calling for naivety. He's not saying, don't pay attention to any of that out there. He's saying, look, notice that, but think beyond that. And remember that your father cares for you. And in his great love, he will continue to care for you. And he will preserve you as a son or a daughter of the Most High. And I believe this with all of my heart. And I have no idea what time it is because the clock isn't working. So if you got to go, you got to go. But let me just say this. I believe with all of my heart, our ability or our inability to focus on the reality of the Father will determine a lot about the direction that the church is going. The ability or the lack of ability to focus on the Father. Listen, I was sharing with Pastor a couple weeks ago. Uh, I believe the Lord gave me a dream. And I'm not going to go into all the details because number one, they don't matter. Number two, I don't fully understand them all. But I want to share with you just real quickly what I do understand about it. I was in a, I, I was in a environment and there was this huge dirt arena, like in a circle, like an MMA cage. You know, it was a circle, but it was dirt. It was made up of dirt. And what was happening in the midst of those things is that people were coming together to war with each other in the circle over cultural issues. It had to do with anything that you can think of today was represented in that dream, right? So, so they're, they're coming together and they're fighting against one another, right? And seeing, trying to see who would prevail. And at some point, it was my, my time to join the ring and to fight. And, and again, this has nothing to do with me. Dreams, you can't force dreams. Good dreams don't happen because you're a good person, okay? So I didn't do, I, didn't, I don't deserve any credit for this. This is the Lord. But in the dream, I remember it was, it was my time to fight. And all of a sudden, instinctively, I said, I'm not getting in that ring, right? Because in the ring, what, this is what the ring represented. It represented a lot of cultural issues, but even more than that, it, was, it represented the lies behind the cultural issues, okay? And I know there's two sides to every coin, but I'm saying this is what that represented, and I said, I, I'm not getting in that ring. And all of a sudden, without trying, without thinking, just in a dream state, I began to sing of the goodness of God. And I began to declare his goodness, the name of Jesus, his sovereign power, all that he is. And in the midst as I'm singing, all of a sudden I see a television screen in the, in the corner of the room and, and the news media is on. I don't know who it was or whatever. It was probably somebody you don't like. Um, and so it, it was on, and all of a sudden, as I began to sing, two hands came out, and they wrapped their hands around my vocal cords. And I literally, I was losing, just like right now, I was losing my voice. And in the dream, I thought, I have to fight through this. And I began with everything in me to sing even louder, to begin to declare the goodness of God and the promises of God. And let me tell you what, not only did the hands dissipate, but the ring which represented the issues and the lies of the day began to crumble. And I never had to fight a battle. You understand what I'm saying? So listen. And if you don't believe that was from the Lord, that's okay. That, that's not the Bible. Okay, I'm just telling you, that was an experiential thing. But let me tell you this, this is what I believe, scripturally speaking, and based off of that. I believe that the church that survives will have the ability to see beyond what's going on in the physical realm. Yes. And they will be able to set their sights and say, even if not, there's a king in heaven whom I represent. Yes. And he is above and beyond all of this that's going on. And I choose to trust in him, yes. right? I believe that the churches that survive will have an innate ability to be able to do that. Not only who's above us, but who's below us. Can I remind you that the enemy has been defeated? Yes. Can I remind you that, that, listen, that the blood that was shed on the cross was the knockout punch. And it wasn't just the knockout punch. It was the kill shot. And the enemy, he's alive and well today. But I'm telling you, his end is in sight. He has been defeated. He will not defeat the people of God. They will survive based on the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And we will rise above. So we got to remember who is below us. But lastly, and I, I'm going to close with this. We've got to remember what is ahead of us. We have got to remember the promise of Jesus. He said this. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come for you. Listen to me. Do you remember what the rapture is? 
I know there's a lot of opinions and all this kind of stuff. But can I remind you that there's coming a day he's coming for us, right? And the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us who are alive and remain, we will be called up together with him. Listen to me. I grew up fearing that day. Today, I long for it, right? So as the church, we need to understand that there is a day coming where we are going to be reunited, whether through rapture or whether through death, there is coming a day where we will be in heaven. And I'm going to close with this scripture, Revelation 21. This is what John said. He said, then, this is his vision of what's going on in the other realm. He said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And to John he said, Write this down. Remember this, for my words are faithful and true. And I'm going to tell you, we got to be a people that remember that this world is not our home. There is a bigger, there is a better, there is a more glorious place that we, those who have embraced the forgiveness of Christ, will come to know. Will you stand with me real quick? I still don't know if I'm gone over time or not, um, but I think we're okay. Here in a moment, we're going we're gonna to give you an opportunity. I want to ask our prayer ministry team to go ahead and to step into place. And Pastor Justin, are they going to head out? Um, so if you have any prayer needs today, we're going to invite you out the side door. We've got some folks that would love to pray with you. You don't even have to tell, you can tell them all you want, but you don't have to tell them anything. You just say, I want prayer, and they'll be glad to do that. Um, so today, um, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. But let me just, let me just say this in, in closing, then we're going to pray, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be done. It has been a weird year. Right? I mean, like, super weird. Not just like, oh, that's odd. I mean, like, what, what the, you know? Like, this is a really, you know, but, but can I remind the church, you know, right now, there, there are so many things going on. One of the big things is the cashless system and, you know, the mask and, and all these things. And, and I get it, and everybody has an opinion, and some are probably right, some are probably wrong. I don't really know. Um, but can I just remind the church, we knew this had to happen, Right? Like, if you've ever read through Revelation or any in Thessalonians, we knew that these days had to happen so the coming of Christ could, could come in. We knew these things had to happen. And so my, my call for us today is simply this. We need to settle in. We need to settle in so that we can rise up. And you mark my words, if we can't figure out how to settle in, we will not rise up. We have to remember to stand on the promises of God, Amen. rise into our rightful place, Amen. be everything that God has called us to be in these last days. Listen to me. If you live today, and this is the end of times, I don't know if it is or not, but if it is the end of times, you count it as a tremendous honor that out of all of human history, God called you to live in this moment. That's a big deal. And he trusts you. And he trusts me with it. And we need to honor him for it. Amen. Today, uh, we're going to uh, go into a time of worship, and you can be dismissed or receive prayer. Let me pray for you real quick as we leave. Father, we love you today, and we are so thankful for your goodness. We celebrate the promises of God. We celebrate your goodness, and we pray that the church would never forget to stand upon these things. Father, fortify your people that are listening today. Strengthen us in the Lord. We don't need encouragement today. We need scripture to speak loud and clear. And I pray that as the word of the Lord goes forth, that you will encourage your people and rise us up to be everything you've called us to be. Bless your people. Bless this church. 
our spiritual family in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. The Lord bless you. We love you. Join us for worship and prayer or see yourself to an ultra ministry. We love you so much. Thank you.